Our next speaker is Jennifer Howard, and Jennifer is the founder and CEO of Safe Pets, Safe Families, and has an interest in human-animal companion relationships, animal and human welfare, intergenerational poverty and violence. Jennifer is a recipient of the Joy Noble Medal, which is the highest distinction award an individual volunteer can receive, and she was also nominated for Australian of the Year in 2021. So we welcome Jennifer Howard speaking about Safe Pets, Safe Families. Hello all. Um, so firstly, I just want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the land and the traditional families of the Yagamda region of South East Queensland and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, also, I would like to know um, how many of you have heard about Safe Pets, Safe Families in here? Quite, quite a lot. <laughs> all right. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, I am the, f the founder and CEO of um, Safe Pets, Safe Families, and um, I built Safe Pets, Safe Families out of a personal need. Um, so I experienced domestic violence, and I had two dogs that I had from puppies. So I had um, a Rottweiler named Missy and a Staffy named Ballsy. And um, when I was leaving, I had to flee to a shelter with my kids, and I didn't have anywhere that I could take my take my dogs. And um, and I tried like family and friends and, and back then there wasn't actually many rescues around either. Um, and I didn't want to surrender them either. I tried to hold on to my dogs. And so when I um, fled to a shelter, I was um, going back to, so I was paying rent at the shelter and then I was going back to the house because it still had a little bit of a lease on it. And I was going back and feeding my dogs every day, trying to hold on to them. And that was putting me at risk as well from um, my ex-partner. And I could only do that for so long um, until my lease ran out and then um, basically my dogs ended up at the pound and I'm pretty sure they ended up euthanised um, just because they're breeds and they probably were, would be um, not rehomeable. And, um, but my dogs were everything to me. They were like, um, they were there for, they protected me. They were there for when I was sad, I was crying, I was scared. They were my kids' first best friends. I had them from puppies and um, they were around eight years old when this happened. So... Um, I guess like it never it never left me. I felt really um, haunted by this and um, heartbroken, and it was like a bit unfair, I guess. And I didn't want anyone else to experience what I did. So um, yeah, I just uh, I want I want to also make it very clear that I don't have a degree. <laughs> um, I just definitely didn't have any funds, and I was just a normal sort of everyday person. And I wanted to do something so. Um, basically, what I did was um, I went to Southern Domestic Violence and I went to a place called Eleanor House, which was a homeless support person, a place. And I basically just told them what happened and then I said, like, I'm available to foster anyone's pets if, um, like, I'm stable, I'm in a house and I can have pets. And um, not, I didn't really think, but, like, the next week I got a phone call, <laughs> literally. And um, so then, I like, I fostered my first lot of pets and then... I roped like friends and families into it and then we started a small like Facebook community. Um, yeah, and then it sort of went from there. Um, so our model, um, how I built the Safe Pets, Safe Families model, because um, I, I didn't come from like an animal welfare background, I basically came from a human need. So we are, I did build it on a human sort of service. So we are a one welfare framework. I actually built, before I actually knew what the, like now there's an actual like one welfare concept out there, um, and before I even knew what this was, I didn't realise that that's, that's what I was actually building, and I was um, really excited when I first found out about one welfare, and I contacted them and I said, oh my God, I'm already doing this. Um, so we, um, I guess we're a human and animal um, charity. Um, we have a whole range of networks. We have partner vet clinics, partner animal behaviourists and trainers. Um, we have outreach vet clinics with volunteer vets and nurses. We have a pet food bank um, where we support directly to clients and also other organisations that do food assistance. Um, we have psychosocial supports and we're equitable. Um, and I guess um, one of the other things that um, uh, 
Brooke from Amrik uh, reminded me of that also. We do co-design. Co so I guess that um, I come from a lived experience and I think it's very important for, um, for uh, like animal shelters and stuff if you want to reduce the amount of animals that are coming into shelters to actually speak to the people of like why is this happening because like I guarantee you people don't want to surrender or surrender their animals. It's not... Um, they're, they're doing it because they feel like that's the last resort and they have to. So um, I'll start off with a little case study of um, Christian's story. And I actually shared a little clip in the resources in the, in the Hoover app. Um, and um, there's a little quote there that says, rarely is the human animal bond more powerfully demonstrated than in the love between a person facing homelessness and their pet. Sharing companionship, warmth and security, their relationship is priceless and even life-saving. Um, Christian, like, when I um, first met him, I almost put him in the too hard basket. He was um, addicted to drugs and he was homeless and he had attempted suicide so many times and he was just in a real, real dark place. And um, and he, was, he got kicked out of a housing, say, property and... Um, it sort of was a bit of a drug house, I guess. It was a bit of a bit of a squalor sort of situation, and um, but I don't know. I just sort of seen something, I guess, and I think I seen something in in his dog's eyes. <laughs> and um, the first time I left them on the side of the road was like really heartbreaking. And so I thought, now I'm going to do something for this guy. And um, so we just did a little bit of fundraising and stuff, and we put him in a motel, and we started connecting him to services and. We advocated for him like really hard um, to get housing and um, there was a few struggles in between. There was like a lot that went on in between. But we eventually, we, um, we got him connected to a homeless organisation and the caseworker there advocated really hard as well. She went above and beyond and um, yeah, I can like happily say now that he's been in housing for like four years. Um, he's now got his car licence, he's done his like white card, he's like really connected with like um, work, like a work skill. Um, and he's doing, he's doing amazing. And this is the first time in his life that he's actually positive. But um, I guess the main thing here is though we protected that human animal bond and he got to keep Buddy and they're doing amazing. Um, so it just goes to show that um, when you give someone a bit of a, like a hand up, I guess, like really amazing things can happen for a person and their pet. Um, so some of our programs and services, um, so we've got um, the foster program and since 2016 um, we've helped 1,272 clients and 2,011 animals. Um, then we've got the Paws and Pals Homeless Support pop-up vet clinics and so we've had 46 clinics and so that's 827 pets um, that have had access to free preventative care and microchipping um, so our Paws and Powers program um, is fully, like, fully sponsored by Bowringer. Um, they supply all our vaccinations and our flea and worming. Um, and then we just get donations um, of food from the general public and some pet food stores and um, pet stocks, one of our biggest supporters. Um, and then we have a huge team of volunteers and um, we have connected with um, a, few, a few councils. We do also go out to regional um, SA as well in the Riverland. Um, and I guess, like, the reason why, like, when I first started, I started purely because of domestic violence, but then I realised that there's so many other crisis situations and it doesn't matter what the crisis is, pets are important to people and, like, so we sort of expanded our services and, and what I also found at the pop-up vet clinics, it sort of acted like a little bit of a gateway too because people were more inclined to get help for their pet than themselves. And so we found that sometimes there was people that rocked up to the clinics and they had been experienced domestic violence and hadn't actually connected to any services or anything. So we, this allowed us to sort of help the pet but then also connect the person to services they needed as well. Um, and also we, we have a pet food bank. Um, we're in Marlston in, the, in Adelaide. And um, I guess like the first, the original reason why we started a pet food bank was to provide, um, I guess, food for all our... Uh, foster carers and um, for when our pets were going home we wanted to sort of hand, send them home with um, some food to help them get started and and then during COVID we um, that's when we started the Fuel Their Bowl project and 
Um, now we supply places like Salvi's, Anglicare, Red Cross, all, all different sorts of organisations that supply um, pet food. And, and it's amazing um, the, the impact that, like, just we had um, a client story from Salvi's and there was this older gentleman that his sister died and so he inherited his sister's dog and he was really worried about how he was going to afford these two dogs and um, he was really worried about thinking that he was going to sur- needed to surrender the dog and then the salvos told him that they could supply him pet food and he broke down in tears and like he said it was amazing that he doesn't have to give his dog up anymore and so he goes to the salvos like every week for a, a cuppa um, and and then picks up some dog food and and that support is amazing for him and and yeah it's just the so that community sort of outreach from a from a, a human service um, is amazing and, and prevents surrender. Um, so one of our other like major programs that we have is our community vet program. So our community vet program is a community circular fund. So since uh, actually we've only been collecting data. I didn't put it there, but we've been collecting data since 2020 for our community vet fund. Um, so we've seen 2,301 vet visits. So that's like, so some some pets obviously have numerous vet visits, but that's all our vet visits, um, totaling $496,523. But um, we, so the way that the community um, circular fund works is that we pay the vets up front. Um, we do get discounted services at our vet clinics. Um, all our partner vet clinics um, provide a discount. Um, and then we pop the clients on a centre pay payment. And I guess, like, um, the one thing that really broke my heart is that I so many people um, have to surrender their animals to a vet clinic because they can't afford the vet care. And then I always couldn't understand why a rescue would come in and sort of pay the vet bill and then rehome the animal. And I was like, I was like, why can't they, like... Because what if this animal, like, that's the only family they ever knew? What if it's an animal that they've had for 10 years or something can that animal doesn't want to leave their owner either. And, like, so can't they give an opportunity for the client to pay that money back? Um, and it's, like, I, like I, we have, like, a really successful, um, like, rate of people paying back the money. We do offer incentives to help, like, make the program a bit more successful. We, while someone's paying off a vet bill, we'll offer them pet food. So we'll just say, like, while you're paying off this vet bill, we can, we can like, drop off pet food monthly. And that, that really helps people. And I guess if you give them a bit of a hand up, um, you can sort of, um, yeah, give them incentives and they feel safe to come back to you. Um, we have a youth and pets program as well, which teaching empathy and education to youth become responsible pet owners. Um, one thing that we found when, um, especially when um, youths come out of state care and they go into independent housing, um, one of the first things they do is get a pet. And um, and then sometimes there was tenancy problems and they would end up with like puppies and kittens and all sorts of things. And so this is just providing um, a pathway for them to be able to get the vet care they need and training um, and to just to teach them how to be responsible pet owners. Um, and then most recently, we um, got funded by the Office of Ageing for um, a program called Pause with Friends, and that's supporting older people and pets through life transitions and beyond. And I've got a little story here, um, Impy's story, and um, this is one of the reasons why we started this program. And um, so Impy's, um, Impy's owner, she um, did have cancer as well, and she went into respite, and I sort of did think that she was going to... I thought she was going to come home back into independent living... Um, but the foster um, and the foster said that he would keep keep Impy as long as needed, sort of thing. And we um, was visit, visiting a like a nursing home for every week with Impy, and it was really good. You could let Impy off the lead at the door, and Impy would run straight to her room and knew where he was going. And um, it was just a really nice a really nice thing that we could he- help keep them connected through this period. Um, and then COVID hit, and we couldn't do visits anymore. And um, and it really like the owner deteriorated and um, it was really sad that we couldn't sort of continue visits and and then the nursing home and family had called us and said that um, she wasn't she was basically going to pass away within 48 hours and and all she was calling out for is a dog um, and they allowed us to go there during COVID and just to take the vi- to to let help her like yeah say goodbye to her dog and it was just a really beautiful a beautiful thing to do to be able to give someone's um, last wish, I guess, and that's why we created Pause with Friends because we wanted to help keep people connected to their pets through 
life transitions and beyond, basically. So we provide some in-house supports and um, keep them connected to community and, and, yeah, just help people stay with their pets for longer. So some of the impacts on the wider community, animal management, animal shelters and rescues, health system, vet clinics, human service, domestic violence, homelessness, mental health and more. Um, I guess with, uh, like, most of the animals for animal management, most of the animals that come in our care are not microchipped, not registered, not to sex. And when they leave our care, they are, most of them are, my, like, well, they're all microchipped and all registered. Most of them are to sex. Some, some people don't want to sex the animals. And, and we're okay with that, and we'll provide education. Um, and eventually, they usually come around and end up to sexing their animals. Um, <laughs> And then the health system as well. When people go to hospital for mental health for mental health issues, sometimes people go to hospital six to eight times a year. And um, we work pretty closely with RSPCA and SA. And RSPCA will they will give like one free week for people experiencing um, mental health or homelessness, um, but they'll only give that once a year. And um, so if someone needs to go to go more than once a year, what are they meant to do? They they have to surrender their pets. So. We take their pets into foster care every every time they need to go to hospital, and that prevents them needing to surrender their pets. Um, and it's the same with um, yeah domestic violence and all sorts of sort of human crisis situations when someone has a pet. Um, and I think it's like really important that um, animals should be recognised as a major support in people's lives. And um, when in hospitals, like social workers, domestic violence, any any sort of human crisis, the animals should be included to people's care plans and safety plans. Um, it's so important. Um, and basically, um, if you want to care for animals, you must care for their humans too. Um, it's sort of, I guess, like I've always sort of thought that is it really successful if, like when we're, if animals are being surrendered, like in the and they get rehomed, and like the the family that originally owned them are heartbroken of losing their pets. And yeah, what what does it take just to support someone keeping their pets? And I guess an important thing to know that an animal lover, even if they surrender their pet due, due to a crisis, they're going to get another animal. And so it's much better to support them with their original pets. And that's it. <laughs> well, thank you.